Hello, I'm Seema and welcome to part one of the chapter Thermodynamics. Let me introduce this new topic Thermodynamics to you. What is Thermodynamics? The study of energy transformations is known as Thermodynamics. Thermo means heat and dynamics means the dynamics, the changes which take place in heat. Basically, it's not just heat, it's all forms of energy. But since we are talking of chemistry, in this chapter, we are going to be mainly concerned about heat changes. So in this topic, that is thermodynamics, we study about the energy changes. But before we actually come to the study of thermodynamics, it is important to know uh, certain terms that are used in thermodynamics, which you should be aware of in order to uh, facilitate your understanding of the topic. Whenever we are trying to study energy changes or uh, you must know, let us say we are burning a piece of coal. If you're burning a piece of coal, what happens? It results in the evolution of heat. It results in the evolution of heat which makes the surroundings, whatever is around the coal, it makes that area warm. That's what we do in a bonfire. We burn the uh, wood, logwood or we may have uh, coal and the coal fire or the logs that are burning, they make the area around it warmer. So whatever was taking place, whatever reaction was taking place in the burning coal or in the burning wood, it made the surroundings warmer. How did it do it? It gave out heat and that heat that was given out made the surroundings warmer. So what is it that we are talking of when we are talking of heat changes? If you really see, if you look at the entire surroundings and the coal, there was energy in the coal which got converted into chemical energy in the coal which got converted into heat energy and it was radiated to the surroundings but if you take the entire area, the energy remained conserved. Whatever heat was given out by the coal was now present in the surroundings as a raised temperature. So ultimately, in the energy, it remained conserved. Then if energy remains conserved and actually nothing changed, then what is it that we are trying to study in thermodynamics? We are trying to focus on that system that we are trying to see that is the burning coal and we are trying to see how does the system affect the surroundings when we burnt coal what happened to the surrounding area to the surrounding air it warmed up the area around the coal so we say whatever we are observing is the system and whatever surrounds it that forms the that whatever surrounds it is known as the surrounding so these are two terms that we commonly use, the system and the surroundings. So what is system? The system is what we are observing, our area of observation. Let us say a reaction is taking place in a beaker. So the beaker is what I'm focusing on. I'm trying to study a chemical reaction or something that's taking place inside the beaker. So the beaker would be my system. The beaker is my system and whatever I have, let us say the beaker is present in a, uh, in a chamber or in a room. So this beaker is present in this room. So the room, let us say, is around it. The room would be the surrounding. Now let us say the beaker is not present in a room. It is present outside. It's present outside and it's out in the open. Now what would the surrounding be? The surrounding would be much larger because now the surrounding would be the earth, you may say. And why just the earth? Whatever the beaker is being surrounded by the entire universe. So the entire universe has the beaker and the surrounding. So what do we say is the universe? The universe is nothing but for thermodynamics you know it's actually funny to call it the universe because uh, but in a way it is true the entire universe makes your area of focus the beaker that the system and the surroundings the system and the surroundings together make the universe interesting 
So the universe is the system, that is what is system, the area that we are focusing our study on. So when we say the area that we are focusing on our study on means that we are trying to see whatever change is happening inside the beaker, how is it going to affect its surroundings? So we are actually only studying these walls of the beaker and the opening. So when we talk of the system, what is it exchanging with the surroundings? We, have, we should know what does it exchange, what is the possibility of exchange with the surroundings. The system can exchange matter with the surrounding. How can it exchange matter? Let us say that I have water boiling in this uh, beaker. If water is boiling in this beaker, heat is going in and the water that boils turns into water vapor and it evaporates from the beaker. So it leaves the beaker. So water vapor is matter. It has molecules. So matter can leave the, the system. And if matter is leaving the system, what else can come in and go out of the system? You are heating it up. So it means heat can enter. That is energy can enter or leave the system. So when we talk of system and we want to classify systems, we have to keep in mind two things. One is matter and the other is energy. And on the basis of what, what the system can exchange, we can classify systems into three types. Systems can be classified into three types. Oh, systems are classified into three types. Now we've talked of the system and the surrounding. So the systems, the first type of system is an open system. In an open system is this beaker with water, you can imagine. It has an exchange of both matter and energy can take place in an open system. So you can provide heat to it, it gets cooled down after a while. So through the walls of the beaker or by providing heat or putting it in an ice bath, you can cool it down or you can raise the temperature of the beaker or the contents of the beaker by providing energy to it. So exchange of both energy and matter is taking place through the beaker. So an open system, you have an example here, is an open system is one where both matter both matter and energy are exchanged in an open system, right? The second type of system that you have would be a closed system. Now, what would a closed system be like? If I cover the beaker now with a lid, if I cover it with a lid, let me, let me say I have a china dish or a petri dish and I, with a petri dish, I covered it up. Now I'm heating it. This is covered. And now what happens when you cover the beaker? You can provide heat to it. You can still put it in an ice bath. You can still warm it up or cool it down. But the water that is present inside the beaker cannot escape from the beaker. So. A closed system would be one in which matter cannot be exchanged but heat that is energy can be exchanged. So a closed system is where matter cannot be exchanged but heat can be. So an example would be a reaction that is taking place in a closed vessel. If the vessel is closed, whatever reaction takes place, but the walls, now the walls of a system are known as the boundary. The walls of a system, they are known as the boundary. So what separates the system from the surroundings? A boundary separates the system from the surroundings. Now this boundary may be like a beaker where there are actual physical walls or it may be imaginary. Like if you're just focusing on a reaction that is taking place in front of you and there is, it's not taking place in a beaker, then there is the walls or your area of focus or the boundary that you have created is only imaginary. So now when you have
have a closed system, from the closed system through the boundary, energy can enter and leave but matter cannot. So for a closed system, a proper physical boundary or a physical wall is necessary to keep it closed. In an open system, the boundary was not really essential because the exchange was taking place continuously with the surroundings. Now, the, if you really notice, the second type of system, that is the closed system, is a little restrictive. How is it restrictive? In an open system, both heat and matter could be exchanged. But in a closed system, heat can or energy can be exchanged, but matter cannot be exchanged. The third type of system is even more restrictive and it is known as the isolated system. In an isolated system, neither matter nor energy can be exchanged. Neither matter nor energy can be exchanged in the case of an isolated system. Now, if you imagine that the walls of this beaker were double walled and there was vacuum in the walls and even the lid, it means now you have an insulated beaker or an insulated jar. If it is insulated, neither can energy be given out nor can matter be given out. Such a system would be known as an isolated system. Practically, having an isolated system is kind of impossible, but you can go close to an isolated system by imagining a thermos flask. In a thermos flask, we put a hot drink into the thermos flask and we just close the lid once. And once that it is closed, the walls of a thermos flask are insulated. They do not allow heat to go out. So the drink that you put inside the thermos flask, whether it was a hot drink or a cold drink, it maintains the temperature for a much longer time. Why much longer do I say? Because no system is absolutely isolated. Some amount of energy slowly may slow down the process, but uh, it's not completely isolated. But that would be the best example of an isolated system that we could have. So these were some terms that we would be using in this chapter that is thermodynamics. And um, we will now in the next video, we'll start moving on further with our study of thermodynamics. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends and please keep coming back for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.